Good evening, world. Do we have? Yes, people are flooding into our virtual auditorium. A very good evening to everybody who's joining us. I'm looking at the bottom of my screen, watching the numbers appearing because it takes you all a little while all to get online with us. But a very good evening, wherever you are joining us. We're delighted to have you with us. We hope we have people, Norfolk Wildlife Trust members who are locals. We hope we have people with us from further afield, perhaps some people people from Sarah's own Shropshire Wildlife Trust and of course we might have participants from further around the world wherever you're joining us from we're very very happy to have you with us and of course we're very happy to have you with us Sarah Gibson good evening how are you thank you so much it's lovely to be here I'm really well thank you well, it is a great pleasure to have you with us, and I have greatly enjoyed reading your book about which we will be speaking this evening. But before we get on to your lovely book about Swifts, a few bits of housekeeping. Good evening to everybody joining us again. Um, my name is Nick, and I'm a wildlife ambassador for Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And this is yet another of our online CLI calling events, although we have... Um, now started running real life events back on our nature reserves, including the Simon Aspen and Wildlife Education Centre at Clyde Marshes in North Norfolk. Although we've started doing that, we're still running events because they've been very, very popular. And we're delighted that you can find our upcoming events on our website, which is clycalling.com. And the next two events coming up are Ian Carter um, discussing on the 28th of October his wonderful book Human Nature. Now Ian's a very interesting guy. He was the guy behind the RSPB's in reintroduction of the red kite across much of the UK and he's a deep thinker on nature, someone with a great deal of experience. And so I'm greatly looking forward to discussing that book with him. As I'm greatly looking forward to hosting Anita Sethi, the journalist, on the 11th of November. And she will be talking about her fascinating and very important book, I Belong Here, about the experience of a person from an ethnic minority exploring and living in the British countryside. So another one that we're very, very excited about. But we're very excited about this evening to hear from Swift just as the last Swifts leave us. We're talking to Sarah Gibson on her wonderful book, Swifts and Us, The Life of the Bird That Sleeps in the Sky. Now, before we get to that, a couple of things. If you have a question for Sarah, Swifts obviously are very, very popular birds. And lots of you will want to ask her questions about her experience with Swifts and about her book. Please feel free to pop them in the Q and A. And if there are lots of questions, we might not get to absolutely do all of them, but I will select those that we bring in. We might bring some of you live into the conversation, in which case you will receive notification. And some of you, I may read your questions directly to Sarah. David, who is our wonderful producer, who is um, behind the scenes this evening, he is popping links into the chat attached to this conversation. And there you will find links to projects that Sarah mentions. You can also find a link to make a donation to North Wildlife Trust. This is a free event and we're delighted to have everybody with us from across the world. But should you wish to make a donation to help the conservation work that we do across Norfolk, then please follow the link that David's popping into the chat. And please Please also, if you haven't already bought it, purchase a copy of Sarah's lovely book. Not only will you be helping Sarah and helping spread the word about Swift, but by purchasing through the link that David's popping in the chat, purchasing through Wild Sounds and Books, who are our wonderful friends in North Norfolk who stock all the books in our visitor centres, you'll also be making a donation to conservation at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, for which we are very very grateful. Now, Sarah, you're a colleague in the Wildlife Trust's movement, aren't you? You work for Shropshire Wildlife Trust. That's right. Yes, yes. I've yes. worked for them for a very long time. Uh, you don't look old enough to have worked for anybody <laughs> for a very, a very long time. However, really, I want to begin um, because the roots of your book in a sense are in your childhood and your relationship with nature from the early days. So I'm afraid I'm going to read to you several times this evening from your book and some of your lovely descriptions. So if we could start with this. The wild end of the garden was our playground. Under the tangle of bushes, I made dens with my sister. 
In the more tenderly nurtured areas, I pulled stamens out of golden azalea flowers to suck the sweet nectar and picked sawfly caterpillars off roses, sixpence a dozen. One summer, I spent days searching hedgerows for birds' nests and wondered at the intricate construction of a blackbird's woven cup and the mossy secrecy of the wren's spherical home. It's clear from your book that you've been a lover of the wild for a very long time. I have. It's, it's always been a part of my life ever since I can remember. Um, yeah, and clearly I, I grew up in the Sussex countryside. Um, and yeah, we, we always went for walks. My mother loved wildflowers. I learned just the common ones. She was no botanist, but people just learned a lot more back in the day. Um, and I absorbed it as I went along. Which is a lovely way to be, that sort of learning of nature by osmosis, which is what yeah. so many children don't experience in, in this day and age. Yes, absolutely. Everything's become, you have to make so much more of an effort now to go and do it. And Both, both to gain access to nature and also to, 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 to attain information. It's not... It, People in your grandparents' generation, your parents' generation, had ecological literacy from having grown up in the outdoors, whereas people really today, they, they genuinely don't. That's right, that's right. It's, it's very sad, that severing of the link between nature and people. Um, I know that's something the Wildlife Trust are doing as much as they can to remedy in lots of different ways. Um, but yeah. yeah. And that's very much what our work at Cly Calling at the Simon Aspen Wildlife Education Centre is about. We're about trying to reach people and very often trying to reach people who might um, not otherwise have access to nature. That's very strong in our mission to try to reach out. But you have, since your earliest days, in a sense, had a had a sense of loss around nature, a sense of responsibility towards nature. You write, seared into my memory though, is the destruction of hedgerows in the fields around our home. In the 1970s, agricultural intensification was in full swing and farmers were being given grants to grab out hedges in the name of efficiency. Now, obviously in the context of the swift, the changes of the agricultural landscape come back later, but you, it strikes me that you've, you've always had a sensibility that nature is, is suffering around us and you have a sense of duty towards nature. Yes, I mean, I, I think that's true. I, th I think I was very aware of that, uh, even as a child. I think in some ways I, I almost got scared of that. My mother would respond incredibly emotionally to things like hedgerow destruction. It was almost like I had to push it away at a distance. And then, you know, you move on as a teenager, as a young adult, you kind of have different preoccupations. Um, but it was, yeah, it was definitely always there. And I came back to it, you know, quite, um, I, I think I, I, you know, again, I rejoined and I wasn't perhaps the classic profile of a Wildlife Trust member, but I was joining in my 20s, um, even with, you know, b before I had children, it wasn't about Wildlife Watch and doing it for my kids. I just did it for myself. Yeah. Do you know, I was talking not long ago, maybe three weeks ago, um, on the village common that's outside my house, where she has a project to one of our conservation officers, Helen Bukowska, who is a wonderful woman, an extraordinary woman. And she was talking about when she employs people and she says, I look for the people who have passion and who've come at things from a different direction and who haven't necessarily followed that same path because they bring ideas and creativity. And you yourself are... You're involved heavily, aren't you now, with with Swifts in I your am, yes. in your yeah. local town? So tell us, tell us how. First of all, tell us how it came about that you you fell for Swifts because you're obviously dippily in love with Swifts. How did how did how did you let Swifts into your life, Sarah Gibson? I think everyone falls in love with Swifts once they know their story. Um, but what happened with me is I was living in the country, and around me I had house martins and swallows nesting and I, I I loved I loved having them there and then I moved into a town and it was quite a wrench to be leaving my martins and swallows um, but I knew there would be swifts and there were and although I've really never taken any notice of swifts before in my life 
because I'm not really, I'm not a proper bird at, at all, but I just love the birds around me. Um, but yeah, suddenly I just was looking at swifts, listening for swifts. I was completely tuned in and um, I, I, I heard, I heard that Edward Mayer was giving a talk somewhere. Um, Edward Mayer is from Swift Conservation. He's a passionate advocate of Swift and a brilliant speaker. And I, I heard him speak and, and yes, he sold the story of the bird that doesn't, that sleeps on the wing, that eats in the wing, mates, and doesn't touch ground or flat surface for 10 months of the year. I think one of the most extraordinary things about them is they can preen on the wing. They, it, it's just such a feat of acrobatics. They can turn around, they turn their head 180 degrees and and scratch an itch on their back and and, and not lose balance. For a bird with very short, a short neck and short legs, that really is quite an extraordinary achievement. Yeah. Now, before I come to the next, the incident really that, that starts the book and, and starts the story of your love of Swifts, I want to interject with something that Ken Kaufman said that just occurs to me now. Ken Kaufman is possibly the most respected and influential birder in the United States. And he's he's been celebrated since the 1970s as a brilliant, brilliant birder, but also a wonderful man and a wonderful writer and he was once asked what do I do to become a better birder and his, his reply was very insistent and he said do you really love birds and watching birds and the person said well yes and he said then you are a great birder um, okay. because it's the intensity of love not the, yeah. the, the depth of knowledge or experience that is, well, is what matters. That, that, that's, that's, um... I'll keep that in my mind. It's very true. Maybe I am um, a proper birder then. You very much are. And, and it is a, a moment of love that begins your book. You have a sad but intimate encounter with a Swift that begins the story of your life with Swifts. That's right. Yes, yes. Um, I had um, in, I decided to start a little local Swift survey group. And we'd been out for a few evenings in the summer looking for swift nests in, in the town where I live. And it's, a, it's an enjoyable process. You, you do, you look up, you look at places in a different way and you follow the swifts. There's no real pattern as to where to go. You just li listen and look and follow them and hope that as, as, as sunset approaches that you'll see one dive into its hole. Um, and this, you will see maybe one, two in an evening. Um, but this was getting towards the end of the season and um, a very lovely person who's unfortunately died now, Andrew Tello, um, he appeared at the meeting and um, he'd got this bit of paper in his pocket saying that somebody had found a swift. Um, Andrew was very keen on railways and this, this was a railway friend of his who'd found it um, it had fallen probably from the old railway shed and possibly a cat had found it anyway he um so we went and so they were saying this, this, it's in a box it's safe come and find it so we did and um we found this swift and it looked perfectly you know alert but we did that thing, it was like, what do we do? And everyone said, well, what do you do with a swift that's fallen out of its nest is you throw it in the air. And really, <laughs> that is not good advice. That's the worst thing you can do um, because your swift has already fallen and hit, hit the ground. And the chances are that if you throw it in the air, um, it may already be injured or it may just be stunned. But if it's, if it's in a state of shock, it's not going to fly. So the best thing you can always do with a swift that you found fallen on the ground is just put it somewhere, um, somewhere quiet, somewhere dark, maybe give it a little bit of water, no food. Um, but yeah, if you give it the water, it's down the side of the beak, not the top of the beak, it will go down their nostrils. Um, and see how it goes. Um, and maybe try, perhaps the next day, take it somewhere high, hold it in the, your hands, like that, see if it wants to fly, but don't throw it. But we did, we threw it out of a high window. It wasn't a good idea. 
but <laughs> I did look after that swift. Um, and there's the whole story of what happened with the swift um, in that book. I won't tell you what happened to it because no. I need to read the story. But it is the trigger really for the whole story of Swift's and your relationship. And I, uh, just last month, I was talking to Stephen Rutt about his, his new book about the seasons, uh, well, about summer and the wildlife of summer. And, and as I said to him, really what draws you into the story of an animal, the story of a landscape is these, these intimate moments. And it's that moment mm -hmm. with the Swift really that, that shows us about you, but also shows you about uh, us yeah. about your relationship with Swift. It's so you well, found well, it. Well, Swift because it's a really bad moment in its life. Mm. Um, and really we shouldn't be having to pick them up and handle them. So it's, it, it's and mostly you never do get near them because they're remote birds in many ways. They, they define the air, they yeah. are a creature. But I do know that those moments of intimacy, like when I saw them in the tower in Oxford and when I saw them in the tower in Italy, I, I love those moments when you get close to them. They do make they, a real connection. They take you into a completely uh, alien facet of their lives that we yeah. we don't normally have the privilege of witnessing, although we'll come later on to new ways, technological ways of witnessing them. But you mentioned there your Swift group and you, you walk around the town with a the aim to map nests in order the better to protect them. So if I can read to you again, roof renovation can easily be swift friendly, but it rarely is. In my hometown, I decided to find out which buildings were used by the birds, then to try and ensure their holes were retained when scaffolding appeared before renovation work started. To my amazement, around a dozen people joined me on the first outing, fellow enthusiasts keen to find out more about this wondrous bird and its habits. How successful have you, I, I presume, going off on a tangent first, that you then also have to monitor the same sites in the winter time, because if you found places where swifts nest, the scaffolding can go up any time. It, it can go up any time. And it's quite a hit or miss. I mean, I, I think, I, I tend, when I, when I see scaffolding go up, I tend to try and go and talk to people anyway and just see if they might be interested in putting a swift box up. Um, and sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. I actually had a, a problem almost opposite my house last year when a, a house where I knew there were swifts nesting, the scaffolding went up right in the middle of the swift season and my heart sank. Um, and I... Uh, I had a difficult time with the scaffolders who were quite aggressive. Um, but in the end, the, the guy who was doing the roofing was really nice. And he did end up putting in, they, they were putting in new soffits and he put loads of holes in the soffits. Wow. And not they, only have you influenced that building, but you've actually influenced the mind of someone whose job it is to put soffits on buildings. It was, it was wonderful. It, it was really nice. He actually said, because I kept going over and giving him more information and sort of sheets of in, information on the size of the hole and all sorts <laughs> of things. And I, I said, I hope I haven't really given you too much. And he said, no, he said, I've been inspired. I've ordered myself two swift boxes. Oh, <gasps> how my own house. That was brilliant. That is absolutely wonderful. And yeah. it is the, the power of the citizen work you're talking about. Now, he's not someone that needs influencing, but by pure chance today, my very dear friend, Martin Hayward Smith, was here, who's a wildlife cameraman and photographer, um, who's worked with everybody, with David Attenborough, he works with Ray Mears a lot and so on. And he's having an extension built at the moment. And he said, I've ordered 10 Swift boxes. And I said, well, do you have Swifts already? He said, no, but I'm going to. <laughs> Good um, for him. Yes, Good absolutely. Him. Um, yeah. And, and th at 30 pounds each, they're positively reasonable in the, in the yes. context of yes, his ex yes. extension that yes. he's yes. having. That's wonderful. Yes. But today we have real problems actually um, getting swifts into boxes in this part of the country. I think over in the east of the country, East Anglia, wherever, um, I feel like swifts take to them more readily than they do over here. Because hmm. um, one of the projects we had, we put swift boxes in two belfries in the town, playing the calls every summer. And this goes back to 
2000, one of them was 2014, the other one was a couple of years later. And to date, we haven't got them in, but I'm confident that next year they will be in at least one of those because they have been flying up to the Louvres. Excellent. So I went with my heart full hoping this year, but then there was just nothing but some droppings, but next year uh, they will, I'm sure. They will. And there's a word, now I've forgotten it, I'm ashamed to say, but there's a word that you use for a swift who's knocking at the door of a nest. Banger. A, a bang, absolutely. <laughs> and they get firmly repelled if there, if there is a swift already in residence. Absolutely, yes, yes. yes. Um, swifts defend their nests very passionately um and if 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 the if they try screaming to send if this if if a banger comes along looking for its nest looking for a nest and um it comes to a place already occupied the the resident swift will shriek at it scream at it but then sometimes um the bird will actually go into the nest foolishly and then there'll be a fight and with their sharp hooked claws, they'll lock together. And sometimes these fights go on for hours. I was astonished by that, that these fights can last for, as you say, for hours and hours and hours yes. with, with the dominant bird locking the other one down. Yes, oh, yes. and one trying to push the other out of the hole. Quite, quite extraordinary. And you mentioned something else which ringing studies have revealed, which absolutely blew my mind, which is that year two swift, are much more tentative in their approaches. When they bang, they only sort of poke their heads in. Yeah. And then year three swifts who are thinking about nesting the following year, they actually scrabble on the outside and are trying yeah. to so, get so, in. So the, year, so the younger ones, the year two ones, are just kind of caressing the hole. And then the year three ones are really serious about it and okay. knocking. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, it, 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 you know, it's been said um, the most important thing a swift has to do in its life is to find a nesting hole. Mm. It's a very serious business and they put everything into it. And once you've found a nest hole, then guaranteeing a mate is, it's, it's the easy part. Yes. Um, yeah, because yes. everybody wants a nest hole and if you have control of the nest hole. And there's a particular call a male makes when he's claiming yes. that he has a nest hole. There is a sort of three... Um, whatever, three short, sharp notes. And yes, it's a sort of, I have a nest call. Extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. But before we get deeper into the life cycle of our Swift, as we might call it, even though we lent them for a few short weeks yeah. in the summer, and they are a bird of a massive distribution across Europe, Asia, and of course, in non-breeding time, Africa. Before we get to that, you have a chapter on the context, really, of our Swift, and the Apodidae, the, the Swift family in general, and some truly extraordinary Swifts. I'll just read you one example. There, there are many, but this one, I, I've been, I'm someone who's had the enormous privilege of seeing many, many birds in many places, and I've never heard of this before, so I was quite, quite fascinated. The Australian Swiftlet, the only one to breed in that country, has a unique incubation strategy. Like other Swiftlets, it builds its nest in colonies in dark caves. Like others, it uses a combination of twigs, feathers and grasses glued together with saliva to create a cup-shaped nest. And like others, in the Swift family, egg laying appears to be stimulated by rain. However, the timing of its laying is utterly distinctive. Two clutches of a single egg are laid, the second one appearing three weeks before the first chick fledges. In this way, the nestling chick assists in incubation, enabling the parent to keep hunting for food. The Australian swiftlet is the only bird in the world known to behave in this way. As Alice would say, curiouser and curiouser. Absolutely. <laughs> And there are so many examples you give of swifts being really bizarre birds. Now, I, you, you couldn't possibly know this about me, but I lived in South America for 10 years. And so I have skin in the game where swifts like white collared swift and chestnut collared swift and great dusky swift are concerned. Tell us a little about those birds, which are all friends of mine from the time when I lived abroad. Oh, well, I, I, I think I should be getting you to tell us tell more because... <laughs> I, I've got very scanty information about them at all. 
Oh, no, that's not true. Tell us about Cypsiloides. Tell us about um, great dusky swifts and their ilk and their remarkable nesting habits. Behind waterfalls. Behind waterfalls. Yes. It's quite Behind extraordinary, waterfalls. isn't it? We think that our swifts have it hard when they fledge. And as you say, we'll come to this later on, the chick may start migrating the very day that it fledges. And that just melts my mind, that yes. fact. But not only... but. Cypsiloides swifts, they fly the nest and they have to fly through a curtain of water yeah. a second really after they powerful leave. powerful torrent of water, not just a dribble. Yeah for, yeah, for people who don't know these swifts, look up Great Dusky Swifts at Iguazu. Now, Iguazu, of course, you'll have heard of is the, the giant waterfall on the border between Paraguay, Argentina and um, Brazil. And um, the Guarani name for it, Iguazu, it means big water. And it is, it is very big water. And if you were a fledgling swift taking off for the first time ever, you've got to fly through that curtain of thundering water, just yeah. mind blowing stuff. But it's you had- strength a, that's needed, yeah. But you had a particular liking, didn't you, for some of the bigger ones, for white collared and chestnut collared swifts? Oh, I just, I mean, I was, I was getting to know them through books mm. and things like chestnut collared sprang out because it had some colour on it. But some it's of them it. have, some of them have wonderful, well, even our own, you see, I'm just calling it our own, as a kind of iridescence, the common swift, when you get close to it, and you, they look black when you see them in the sky, but really they're sooty brown. But when you see them close, they do, they have an iridescence. And I saw that when I was looking after the swift, it actually had a purplish sheen. And it's true with, um, yeah, I mean, a, 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 a lot of the different species of swifts have a little bit of colour, but mostly darkness suits them. Um, I, I I've also had the immense privilege of spending, I don't know, four or five years in Asia. And one of the most extraordinary mind blowing places I've ever been is a cave in Borneo called Gomantong mm. in Sabah, um, where glossy swiftlets, mossy nest swiftlets, edible nest swiftlets and black nest swiftlets all nest together in addition to about 20 species of bat. And the place reeks of guano. I mean, it's, it's almost unbreathable inside, but you're in this cave that is heaving with these remarkable birds. It must be wonderful. I'm, I'm most envious. Maybe it, is, it is quite, quite extraordinary. But our swift is also extraordinary. So here, here are some things you write about our own swift and its very remarkable lifestyle. And lastly, here is Apus Apus, the common swift, flying 10 months of the year without cease. It breeds across a vast swathe of the world from Western Europe to China, wintering in Africa for eight months of the year. It is by far the most abundant of the swift, meriting its vernacular name in global terms and listed as the eighth most numerous wild bird species in existence. I had no idea about that. Worldwide, there are estimated to be somewhere between 95 million and 165 million of them sailing across the skies. This really is very much a bird that belongs to the to the old world, isn't it? It is. It is. A, it is. And it's a, a bird. That, it is a global bird. It's a bird that links us all across the world. Loved and shared by so many people in so many different countries. Mm. Um, nesting in temples, churches, houses, over shops, warehouses. It's a bird that should and has been common. It still is fairly common, but just not as common as it as it used to be. And it's wonderful that idea, we'll come back to this right at the end of our conversation, but that idea that it is a bird that links us all across Africa, yeah. across, across Asia, across Europe. It is a bird that belongs to us all, but doesn't belong to any of us because it Absolutely. is a wild free spirit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yet it is brought to us because as you say, yet there is one thing the sky denies them, a place to rear their young. For this, they must descend like mortals and behave as other birds do, seek out a safe hideaway, build a nest and breed. And that's what brings them into intimate and sometimes often dangerous contact with us humans. 
that's right yes yes I mean it, it the relationships work really well for them for thousands of years um I mean clearly at some point before people were the Swift have been around an awful lot longer than people but the buildings that we've made over the centuries have been good for them and provided them with lots of they've been like cliffs with holes in them we still have some swifts at nesting cliffs um there's some in dorset there's some in northern ireland and oh, someone was telling me um this year about some in um in italy where he'd been swimming in some caves and seen swifts um flying up into holes in the roof of the cave so yes they do there are some still in natural sites but building 99 uh, percent where the common swift will will nest and it has it, it served them very well but there are problems now because we're renovating our homes so successfully and um building regs a state that we shouldn't be leaving holes in new build and um, modern building techniques and plastic soffits and things like that are generally not hospitable to swifts unless you drill holes into them. Um, so yeah, the, there is a problem with nest sites. Now I'm going to interject here with a question which comes from Mark Pointer and uh, sadly I know the answer to this but you'll clarify. Do you know if new house buildings, house bu if new house buildings are encouraged to include swift housing bricks? Um, They're encouraged by people who love swifts to do so, but really this is not mainstream yet. Um, there are certain uh, builders, one of the outstanding um, leaders in this whole business of putting nest bricks in is actually the Duchy of Cornwall who are installing one nest brick per dwelling which is absolutely uh, it's at the ratio of one per dwelling they might put several in one and none in another depending on the suitability of the site but that's that's the way ahead and we there is some cautious optimism that this might start being adopted more widely um there will soon hopefully this autumn be a british standard nest bird brick which means that sounds incredibly dull um, but what it means is that the guidance will be there um, for all developers on the, the on the right size dimensions of a, of a nest brick and it's been designed and tested and it's based on the swift brick which seems to suit an awful lot of birds where they put them in in Cornwall and they've monitored them a lot they've even found house martins going into them and you just think that's strange because they build exterior nests. Um, but perhaps in a year when it's been very dry and you've been able to find enough mud, a ready-made hole is just the thing. Um, so basically, developers don't want to have lots of different bricks for different birds and things that suit butterflies and whatever. So it really makes sense to have a, a standard nest, not one that will accommodate pigeons, but small birds um, and this will, it'll be good for sparrows and where sparrows go, swifts will follow because um, they make a lot of sparrows, as I'm sure you know, make a lot of noise and alert other birds to the presence of holes. I was, then swifts can go and throw them out. I was fascinated by that. I have, I have two swift boxes on the back of my house here, which is the, the cooler side because they're external boxes, but I have sparrows that nest in the front. I have two pairs of sparrows who nest in the front. And they, I don't, despite the fact swifts nest all along the street here, I don't have swifts nesting in my roof, but that's the reason I put boxes on the other side so that in the hope that the swifts that live and nest here would nest, although they haven't done yet. Um, I have blue tits nesting in the boxes on the back. Um, but I was fascinated that the presence of sparrows is not necessarily prohibitive. Indeed, it might be a positive thing because the cheeping of the young sparrows can attract the attention of the swifts who will then hoof them out the next year. It can. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's often conflict between the species um, and it can be quite hard to watch. I mean, I, I was talking to someone today who was talking about how um, 
sparrows will land on the back of house martins. And I've heard they can do this to swifts as well and push them down. They all defend their nests. But then swifts, um, they, they will, if they're really determined, and we're probably talking the third or fourth year bird, they will actually go into a nest and go and sit on the young and the and the, and sit on the nest, the occupied nest, for hours. They've got they they do endurance with so they do endurance with their fights and they do endurance when they're trying to claim a nest. They'll just sit it out, and eventually, um, the swift will the sparrows will probably be off. In fact, I think right now the um, the swift schoolmaster who is a passionate swift. Um, activist really who also had swift, uh, swift boxes in his house and in a town he he once found a swift nest built on top of a nest of sparrows and the dead fledglings underneath so it can be quite gruesome goodness me they're fearsome birds they really are and even between themselves the course of love is not necessarily unbumpy shall we say you write the pairs seldom arrive on the same day but if this does happen it is likely to be coincidence their bond exists only for the breeding period and outside this time they live separate lives when the second bird returns usually within a few days their initial greeting is sometimes hostile they raise their wings scream at each other and lock feet as they do in fights gradually though they accept and start preening one another settling amicably on the nest side by side. They almost seem to be their worst enemies, these swifts, because they're, they're very, very independent minded birds, aren't they? They, 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 they like their independent life. They do. Um, uh, but yes, but they do, once, once paired up, they will stay with each other um, as long as they both turn up within a few days of each other. They will, they are loyal, they are generally monogamous, um, but they're wary and yeah, it, it, it takes time to, like, I guess it could be the same with humans if someone's been away a long time. <laughs> they, they really are the bird that lives in the sky and the sky is their element and, yeah. and yeah. anything to do with coming back to land and having to share their space is something they, they really struggle with, don't they? I think they do. I, yeah. I, 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 watching the video of swifts in nests they just look so so out out of their elements they shuffle along they look so awkward um and yet in the air absolute masters of the skies they just well you know I, I, um but yes the, their feet are they just with these claws they're not they're not i'm not going to say the word designed because they've evolved um but their their feet do not cope well but they cope just enough for the amount that they have to scratch their way over the flat surface of their nest that's all they need to do and that is the origin of the name apus meaning it is without without feet yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Linnaeus, he must have known they did have feet, but at the same time, he was describing the fact that they have apparently flimsy feet, but in fact, they're incredibly good for using as, as crampons. They are. They, they? They're good for what they use them for, and they can cling to vertical surfaces as well. Which... But no good for hiking. No. No, really? certainly no good for hiking. Now, one last thing on the lives of swifts, and this really, we touched on this a moment ago, but this is quite extraordinary. Fledgling swifts leave the nest while their parents are out searching for their next meal. On their return, a large ball of food in their throats to feed their young, the adults are faced with an empty nest and seem visibly perturbed, just as we might by the absence of the chicks. They will poke the nest with their bill as if to check there really is nothing there and jump on and off it. Meanwhile, the fledglings, untaught and impelled simply by instinct, head off almost immediately for Africa, often the same day where they will wander the skies for the next 10 months. Two things remarkable there. One is that by the end of the fledging period, which of course is incubation followed by uh, chick rearing, the parents have actually become very much a unit and very attached to their nest and their chicks. And there is a sign of distress that the chicks have left the nest 
empty nest syndrome, literally. Yes. And the other that the chicks migrate, and this just absolutely does my head in. The chicks migrate the same day as they fledge. They're off, they're just, they have no purpose staying here. Mm. Um, Almost as if we're only tolerant. <coughs> Sorry. You're quite all right. You're quite all right. It's almost as if the Swifts only tolerate us and they really don't want to be here particularly much at all. <laughs> no, they're yeah. drawn back to Africa. They'll head down West Africa, Congo Basin, mm. all the way down to Mozambique. Incredible journey. But the, it, it's almost, it's, to say a journey applies implies a beginning and an end and there is no beginning or an end in the swift's journey it's just a, a life of constant flight now before we move on to the perils that face the swift um which you cover in at some length in your book i'm going to bring in some very good friends of mine dave and caroline gittens who live just up the road from me and who have swift a barrage of swift boxes but dave also has i won't um give his question away too much, but Dave has a camera in um, the nest of one of his Swifts and has a vast amount of information that he's generated from it. So David, can we bring in Dave Gittens? Uh, hello, Dave, are you there? His mic, there we go, you should be live now. Dave, good evening. What's your question for Sarah in the context of your own journey with Swifts? Hello, Nick, and uh, hello, Sarah. Um, Hi, David. Yes, my question is, uh, from all the studies I've done with uh, via the Nest Cam in my um, uh, Nest Box, all of that information is very interesting to me, but I'm, I, I've just got this feeling that I ought to be sending it to somebody else to collate. Who do I send it to? Um, I've tried several people and uh, <clears throat> I've the, got a blank, I, but... I think the main... So, so the information about the number of swifts on your house? Or... No, it, it's actually what I did was, um, and I, I need to get a life at some point. Um, I actually studied the um, swifts and time uh, logged the time that they came into the box and left the box. Right. Now that sounds like very simple information, but from that you can actually derive lots and lots of information, like feeding frequency and when, you know, the first time they leave, the first time uh, and the last time they come into the box. I was amazed that the last time they came into the box, the last adult came in within <clears throat> a couple of minutes of sunset. You know, it really was a trend that you could see throughout the, yeah. not just the um, incubation phase, but through the, uh, the feeding phase. And lots of other bits of information about what time of day was the most likely time that they would actually feed and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it, it's fascinated me, and I've just had this feeling that it might be useful to somebody else. I agree. It sounds an absolutely fascinating story. Um, I, you know, it sounds like you should be writing a paper about it, mm. or, um, or, but who to send it to? Um, there will be. Sorry. Other, no, I was going to say. Obviously, a fair few people do have. Um, webcams onto their swift nest but I think them... so yeah I'm, 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 write it up and and you could send it you could send it to you could send it to swift conservation um that. action for swifts um but I'd, I'd in some ways almost the better thing is to share it with people locally where you live just keep telling the story of what the swift are doing in your box and in your neighborhood. And perhaps in, just by sharing more of the details that you're able to record. And this isn't something I can, I, I don't have, I have Swift in my roof, but not in an accessible place where I can put a camera. So this is something I've never done. Um, so wonderful that, because they've, studiously ignored any swift boxes I've put up they just uh, the holes <laughs> mine too. Mine too. If, yeah. if I can give you some encouragement it took me five years it took us five years Did it? Uh, yes. including uh, calls and all the other things in fact the first time the swifts came into our box was it during a period when I wasn't playing 
um, the call. So uh, the jury's out on that one a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, you can't tell them. But keep the faith. Keep the faith. Uh, they, they will come. Yeah. But I think Dave is, is right. Thank you very much, Dave, for, for your question. Um, I think Dave is absolutely right that it, there's... It's not just the power of his own data, but the same thing is replicable across every Swift box with a camera in it, which must now be many hundreds, if not thousands. Absolutely. And there must be the potential for a citizen science project at a, um, at a university, or it doesn't need to be at a university, could be at any other wildlife-minded organization. Uh, it's, a, it's an extraordinary- It could be a brilliant moment. project, yeah. Yeah, quite, yeah. quite. Well, there's a next- yeah, a next project for you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> help Dave and Caroline out with their Swift. I think actually it would help Caroline because Dave spends his whole life counting the comings and goings of Swifts. And I get a lot of texts about these wonderful Swifts in Dave and Caroline's roof. Um, but Swifts are facing a very hard time and they're facing a very hard time across many fronts, really, aren't they? And they are. um, you write about agriculture you say agriculture's dependence on pesticides is disastrous for invertebrates nature reserves need to be enormous if their insect populations are to withstand the effects of chemicals applied on crops in surrounding fields and then a little later according to the department for environment food and rural affairs defra farmers in the uk sprayed on average 17.4 applications of pesticide to each hectare of arable land in 2015, using 16,900 tonnes of active ingredients. Imagine what this means for those creatures that depend on a good supply of insects, such as bats, hedgehogs, and all our songbirds. Even seed eaters, such as goldfinches, need insects mixed in with the seeds they give to their nestlings. Crashing insect populations are wiping out the food supply of insectivorous birds, quietening the dawn chorus in hedgerows, woods and gardens. The threat of a silent spring is very real. We are, and sadly this is, it's impossible to be a conservationist without dying every day <laughs> and without grieving and without this constant sense of powerlessness. But it is, it has to be, acknowledged if to, we're to make any difference. In the last 70, 80 years, we have utterly changed the way our landscape works for wildlife and, to be blunt, made it terribly hostile to most of our wildlife, including swifts. Absolutely. Um, I, it's something we've almost got used to. We see green fields and we think all's okay, but those green fields tend to be just four or five kinds of grass or one kind, one monoculture of crop. And you look at it and you think, actually, that land's dead. There's nothing alive in it apart from the, the crop itself. And that's, it's quite a, a scary thought when you focus that closely on it, when you really look at it. Um, it is an incredibly hostile world for wildlife now. It's been driven to the margins, and even the margins are getting gobbled up now. Our brownfield sites, I mean, there, there is hope. There's, you, you have to come back to the positives. Um, there are new farming schemes that pay, pay for beetle banks and headlands, wildlife headlands. There is recognition that things need to change. It's just never enough, never fast enough, never properly funded. To, to get enough people to do it. There are some wonderful examples where um, the, things like no-till agriculture can be um, really, really good at restoring invertebrates um, within conventional farming system. Um, so they might use some no, I think I've heard that where you have I, I actually visited such a farm this summer. And through no-till, he'd ended up not having to use any pesticides at all. Um, although it was, it was in many ways an intensive farm, but some kind of balance had been achieved and it was brilliant for birds. It can be done. There are, way, there are farmers, there are people experimenting. There are a lot of different approaches um, for different kinds of farming systems. And the knowledge is there, 
it just needs to be more widely taken up and supported financially. And indeed, that's the, the revolution that we hope for in the, with the arrival of ELMS, let us hope that that's the environmental land management scheme. Let us hope that it um, does indeed change the nature of our relationship with wildlife, but for the good, because for the last 70 years or so, it's pretty much all been for the bad. But let's not dwell on the too negative. We know that swifts are declining enormously in the whole of the UK, very, very fast, your book says, in, in Scotland, in fact. But let's move on now to what I would call swift heroes, because you visit a number of people through the book in the UK and elsewhere who are fighting tooth and nail for swifts and really inspiring communities and influencing policy. Um, and you're right, fortunately, not everyone shuts their eyes to the fact that once common species are failing to thrive in our fast changing world and dwindling into rarity, such people do not wait for official designations and conservation strategies to creak belatedly into action. There are those whose instinct is to do something themselves, who believe that change starts with local personal actions, and that if there are others who share this outlook and make similar changes, the impact could be huge. Tell us about some of the people who, you described some quite remarkable people, some of the people who are fighting for our swifts, in the UK first of all. In the UK first of all, so um, I think I've mentioned already Edward Mayer, um, who started with, London, started with London Swifts when he noticed um, he lived in London, he noticed his neighbor that the um, roofs in his street were being stripped off and swift nests filled up. Um, so he started something called London Swifts, which then became international because he set up a website back in the days when websites were quite revolutionary. Um, so Ed Edward has become um, a campaigner, a wonderful speaker, or a, in this country, talking to architects, anyone who will listen, really. Um, so he he's a really good communicator. Then there's Dick Newell in near Cambridge, who used to invent software systems, enormous data software systems, but then he retired and got into boxes for barn owls and then boxes for swifts, and then he just goes and tinkers away and he's shared at all different kinds of with Fox Design um, and has inspired many people within East Anglia to set up their own projects. Um, so there are people who are doing swift boxes, people who are doing communication, and then there's Stephen Fitt down in Exeter who has been a quiet, determined advocate for the nest brick. Um, which is basically a brick with a box inside it. So that, so installing them, providing an integral Swift Next box, seems to me to be really the way ahead because once it's there, once that box is installed, it's there for the duration of, of that building. Um, whereas perhaps a wooden box has a bit of a shorter lifespan. Um, so he has worked also, um, he has health problems, so he rarely actually leaves his house, but he's constantly on the phone or um, emailing, uh, works with planners, all sorts, and the southwest of England has been there, I would say, the adoption of the Swift Brick has been, he's pioneered it, and it, it's taking off with a number of developers. Um, it's spreading. That is wonderful news and it's not just in the UK is it? You also have friends in uh, continental Europe. I had a wonderful time going to see Swift people in, uh, in Europe. Mm. It, it lit up my holidays because I didn't just go as a tourist, I went and, and oh, that was one of the lovely things about doing this is I met so many inspirational people um, so I saw, I went to Switzerland and met um, Bernard and Marcel, who were both very much into Swift boxes and very passionate about what they're just, again, good communicators um, and were influencing things like, I think in the, in, in Switzerland, they managed to 
influence the lawmakers so that they they would put swift nest bricks into new buildings of a certain height and um uh, spain i think they were struggling a bit um because there was a bit of an area of complacency there about well swifts will always be here we've always had them they'll stay forever but really passionate people and people involved in trying to um, keep swift populations. There was a bad case in, um, and I'll say this wrong, Catheris, a medieval Cat town. Catheris, Catheris. Catheris, yeah. Um, restoration works going on in Catheris, the medieval walls full of swift holes. Um, that, that's, not, that's not a story with such a happy ending because the authorities were very resistant to um, putting, to keep to maintaining and retaining the holes. Um, but there are others, there was um, a guy in Italy and he did uh, Mauro, he, he worked with his local authorities um, to persuade them to keep the swift holes in, in, in towers there. Uh, but yes, that is one, of the, one of the things in Italy is that they used to eat swifts a long time ago. And they turned uh, their old fortified towers um, over the centuries into into swift towers. With and it was a, it was kind of status symbol. You'd have a swift tower and a swift keeper, and harvest a certain number of swifts every year, and turn them into little fatty puddings, and give them as, as honoured gifts to um, your friends at Christmas. Um, and those have been converted to to nesting sites for conservation. And you had the privilege of holding a swift. I did. I held a swift. And I think I flippantly or, or humorously, you comment that it was a chubby one and it would have been a pudding in the old days. It would. It would it definitely would. have been a pudding. <laughs> <laughs> but they were quite mindful of the resource, weren't they? Because they were. They, they managed it. They harvested them carefully because they would only take, say, one from the nest. They wanted the swifts to keep coming back. Um, so they didn't just clear them all out. But yeah, clearly that that practice well meant there's still a big problem with shooting in Italy. There's not a problem with swift harvesting. But a lot of these old swift towers have been either fallen into decline or they've been um, the holes again have been cemented up. They've been turned to other purposes. So but this Chuck Mauro has done a wonderful job. He actually rented one of these um, old swift towers and, and, and got it renovated. And it's now got about 100 pairs of swifts. Wow. Wow. But there's a there's a side to in which or an, an element, a degree to which it's it's almost therapy for the people involved, because I'm thinking of right now the, the people who are taking part in Extinction Rebellion, Wildlife Rebellion who are not there because they're attention seekers or because they like causing disruption. They're there because they're desperate for the future of yeah. our planet. And it's what they feel they can do. And your friends who take action for Swifts, they, they can heal themselves through Absolutely. daily advocating for Swifts. Absolutely. I, I, th I think taking action for all of us, taking action is, is in our personal lives is the best thing yes we need to we definitely do need to support um, the organizations like the wildlife trust and other conservation organizations we need to do all that but taking action in our own lives keeps us sane um, and you can make a bit of a difference wherever you live i do believe that and you see it um, in the way we garden, setting up community projects, um, talking to other people, using our influence where we can without being worthy, just talking about our love of wildlife, what you can do. It is important that each of us is, uh, as you say, without being worthy, without being pious, we're all witnesses to how important nature is to ourselves, to us personally, but also to us in a purely biological, physical sense. We need nature, we need biodiversity, we need soils, we need healthy climate, because otherwise we ourselves don't have a place to live and we all need to be advocates for, for this. 
We absolutely do, yeah. We absolutely do. Now I'm going to bring in, if I may, David, Matthew Vickers, who has a question, because we've just been talking about Swifts across various landscapes. And that's really the theme that Matthew's going to pick up. Matthew, you're, you're still muted at the moment. There you go. We should be able to hear you now. Good evening. Matthew? Can we hear you, Matthew? No, we don't seem to be able to. You, despite the fact your microphone is unmuted, I tell you what, I will read your question. Apologies that we don't seem to be able to bring you in. Matthew's question is this, does the diet of Swifts vary from area to area or do they always seek the same insect food source? I've been monitoring Swift poo deposited out of the nest above my back door and was surprised that it consisted mainly of beetle carapace. Matthew, perhaps you could pop in the Q&A, which I'm monitoring, where you are more or less, so we know where you're getting a diet of beetles for your swifts. But the question is about the variety in their diet across landscape. Absolutely. Swifts eat a huge range of different insects and invertebrates. Um, basically, whatever is around, but it could vary from the, the, the top end. They might eat a a damselfly or mayfly, um, but whatever gets whisked up into the air, spiders, small beetles, aphids, hoverflies, all kinds of things. But it, 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 and there is some concern. I was actually looking at the, the website of the Oxford University Museum Tower and um, they've had 75 chicks veg this year, which isn't bad. But as George Candlin, the um, the guy who monitors them every year, was saying there are actually 147 nest boxes there. And he believes that the limiting factor in occupancy is, is like lack of insects. Mm -hmm. And they've noticed, um, it was, they've obviously quite carefully monitor swift poo as well. And they've noticed a kind of weevil beetle that they'd not seen before. And he was saying that he thinks they need to do more research into swift diets um, to see if they're having to eat more, I don't know, substandard food, less ideal food. Um, some of the places we know they do really well, um, like in Northern Ireland, they're eating these midges, midges that, the corona midges that come out of the locks and um, I think they're quite nutritious but things like beetle beetles yeah there's going to be a lot of hard um shell there isn't there which I, I don't know that that's going to be so nutritious um and of yeah, course so anything that's coming out in the poo as solid yeah. structure hasn't ha is undigested it's it gone is. through the digestive yeah. system yeah. and uh, Matthew's kindly answered that it's uh, in Lincolnshire not far from the River Trent that he lives so that's where he's getting predominantly beetles uh, in his swift poo so there's there's your answer Matthew that they have an immense variety of food now the last thing really I wanted to touch on Sarah is <laughs> it flows right through the book and is is very significant, which is really what what Swifts mean to us. Now we've we've touched on this, but here are here are a few things that you say. Flight is not simply a means of moving across the world, a way to catch prey and feather feathers for a nest. It is a whole language through which these birds make their intentions known to each other, the very essence of the Swifts being. And then later in the book, revered, ignored, unnoticed, studied or beloved, these birds are a living connection between people across the planet. The screeching of swift parties racing overhead and the softer calls of birds high in the air, their cries mellowed by distance, can be heard by billions of people globally. Their piercing screams echoing over the chatter of hundreds of different human languages, a shared experience ac across nations and cultures the soundtrack of our summers. For you, they're really, they're birds which belong to the sky, but they're also birds which belong to humanity. They are. Um, if, we, if, we, if we let them be, um, they, they, the swifts, they need us for their nesting places, but they mean 
emotionally, they can mean so much to us. They can connect us in so many ways. They're symbols of freedom, um, aspiration. They're, they're, the way that their whole life is in, is in flight. Um, that has inspired so many people. Um, Wilfred Owen um, seemed to be, he took up flying having watched Swifts. Um, Yes, I, I do love this notion of a bird that we have in common mm. in so many places, a common but a common a common bird that we have that is common in many different ways, common to us, common to humanity. And which will be named in a thousand different ways in a thousand different languages. Yeah. And will mean different things in folklore. And at different times of year, it means different things in different cultures. It is weaving us all together in its great loops across the sky. That's right, that's right. Well, thank you, a cup of tea's just arrived. Um, oh, very nice. Nobody's <laughs> bringing me a cup of tea. <laughs> I feel I feel very miffed at this point. But yes, they are these, these remarkable birds that we share. We share them and, but then we, we, we do have a bit of a responsibility to look after them and make sure that they, that we keep them in the skies. Mm. I'm going to confess something now, which is that I'm quite a melancholy creature in autumn. I'm a creature of the spring and the summer, and we haven't really had a spring and a summer this year, and I feel a little bereft. And my swifts have left. I saw my last three, four days ago, and I can't imagine I'll see another one. I don't usually see them in September. My latest ever, though, was the 13th of September at Clyde, which was an exceptional looking up, and there was a swift over the beach at Clyde. Quite, quite remarkable. Well, the main you, suffer, yeah. I suffer from the swifts leaving. And in fact, um, a few years ago, Melissa Harrison edited a series of anthologies of nature writing for the Wildlife Trust. Did you see them? Did, yeah. Yes, and I have uh, an article in three of them. And the one um, for autumn, the first line is, there is a sorrow to September, a space left in the sky by the swifts, because I feel their departure. And yet you've taught me something quite remarkable because you see them differently from that. And I thought this was to end with something quite, quite lovely. But I also love that they go, that their lives are lived elsewhere for nine months of the year without a shred of dependence on humankind, roaming over rainforests and savannah, always in the air. For 90 days, Northern Europe's lengthy daylight hours and relative abundance of nesting holes have been useful to them as they have for thousands of years. Then two or three young raised and job done, they return to a totally aerial existence. It is their otherness that makes them so fascinating. They touch our lives briefly and then vanish. This is part of their magic. You've taught me a new way to look at Swifts and for that I'm very grateful. Well, I hope there's some comfort to you. There is I indeed. Do, the skies do seem quiet, so quiet when they're gone. They do. Um, but next year, in the last week of April or the first week of May, there will be that heart-stopping yeah. moment yeah. where one slices across a blue sky Absolutely. and everything is I right. just love, I, I love seasonality. I just love the seasons. And um, But today I've been watching swallows and martins in their gatherings, feeding and moving on and lighting in ash trees and then off again. And I, I just love the constant movement of the seasons. The knowledge that the world continues to turn. Yes. And yeah. that our axis is tilted and therefore there must be comings and there must be goings. And here living in North Norfolk, the pink-footed geese are on there, oh. on the very verge of arriving. And so very soon my shrieks of swifts will be replaced by the shrill barking of the pink feet back from Iceland. So I'm very lucky in that respect. But I feel very lucky to have spoken to you, Sarah, this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, well, Nick. It's been a real pleasure. Well, it That's certainly has for me. And don't forget, everybody, that you can... Um, purchase Sarah's lovely book on Swifts, uh, The Swifts and Us, The Life of the Bird That Sleeps in the Sky, via the link that David's popped in the chat to Wild Sounds and Books, our wonderful friends in North Norfolk who provide all of our books. And by so doing, you'll make a donation to Conservation at Norfolk Wildlife Trust. Should you be a secret, a closet billionaire, and you wish to leave us vast amounts of money, David's also popped a link to make a donation in the chat, and we're extremely grateful for any 
pennies that you can share us. Don't forget, we have another couple of events coming up soon. Ian Carter's joining me on the 28th of October to talk about his new book, Human Nature, which has had many wonderful reviews. And Anita Sethi, also a wonderfully reviewed book, I Belong Here. She'll be speaking to me on the 11th of November. Now, before I thank Sarah one last time, I have another big thank you to make. This is the very last time that my dear friend David Fieldhouse will be hosting behind the scenes. Uh, he's moving on to a wonderful and exciting new job, which he richly deserves. So for his company, this past 18 months in our online events and the previous year, our live events at Clyde, I'd like to say a huge, huge thank you to David for all of your logistical support and inspiration. And finally, a big thank you to you, Sarah, for joining us this evening and sharing your love of Swifts. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. And thanks to everybody who's been here. Thank you all. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.